Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone who is in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is true. Thank you that it is applicable to every area of our lives. And we pray that you would help us, uh, give us ears to hear, get, help us to understand, help us to, to, uh, to, to believe the things that it promises, to begin to put into practice the things that it teaches us to do. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So I remember, anybody ever been caving before? Anybody ever been into a cave before? Like really into a cave, right? Anybody ever gone deep into a cave and turned out all the lights? Right? In the darkness, I was talking with uh, Matthew and Kaylin about this before the service. The, the darkness is almost oppressive. It's almost like it's pushing down on you. I've heard it said that there's two kinds of dark. Right? There's, there's regular darkness and there's cave darkness. Right? And it's just a completely different level. If you remember those, those kids in Thailand, I think it was last summer, that got stuck in that cave. They were in there for several days and they actually had to be slowly acclimated back to the light again because it would have damaged their eyes for them to go straight into the light. And so I remember one time going caving when I was in high school and we were in a large cave and we went back in about 500 feet um, which you shouldn't do this by the way you should have somebody with you that knows what they're doing when you go into a cave um, but anyways um, and so we got back there and we all turned off the flashlights and it was like just darker if you've never like I said there's two kinds of darkness if you've never been in a cave with all the lights off you, you've not experienced this kind of darkness and one of the things that's frightening is literally you can put your hand in front of your face and you couldn't see anything one of the things that's right that's, that scares us about the darkness is we don't know what's out there right we don't know what's around us we don't there could be something right here if you're in total pitch darkness there could be something right here getting ready to, to eat you or something and you would never know it and, um, and then you turn the, the flashlights back on, right? And those of you that have been in the cave, if you've been in that darkness for a little while and you turn those flashlights back on, right? Was, it almost hurts, right? It's like, it's like a flood. You get the, the smallest flashlight you can imagine. It's almost like a floodlight because you're so, so used to the darkness. Well, Jesus tells us in here, he's using this same kind of metaphor in here. The first thing he says, the first thing he says that you're the salt of the earth, and we're going to come back to that. But the, the first thing I want to look at, he says in verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. So what is he saying here? What about light are we supposed to imitate? And, and as we look at that, the one thing I noticed is, does anybody find it surprising that Jesus says that you are the light of the world, that we are the light of the world? I mean, he's Jesus, right? Shouldn't he be saying, I am the light of the world? And there's other times where Jesus says that. He says that he is the light of the world. But he also says that, that we are the light of the world. And both are true. And, and Jesus said both because they bring up different but important applications for our lives. So what is light? What does light do? Why does Jesus compare us to light? And one of the things I think that's, that's helpful in, as, as we explore that idea is, is if you turn over into 1 John, chapter 1, and John goes a little bit deeper into this idea of light. In verse 5 he says, this is the message we have heard from him and we declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So the first thing here we see, light illuminates what is hidden. 
In verse 7 it says, when you, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and, and, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. But if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. Right? And so light shows us what's hidden. Light, when, when the light of God, when the light of God's word illuminates onto our life, it shows us all those cracks and all those mistakes and all those sin. It shows we can't go on pretending to be without sin because it shows us, it shows us who we really are. Just like in that cave and you turn off all the lights and, and you don't even know what's around you anymore. When you turn that light back on, you begin to see what's around you. You begin to see where you're at and what's going on around you. All that stuff that that was hidden is visible now. And even more than that, Jesus is light to us because he shined on us the light of who God is, God's righteousness and God's character. Jesus is the light of God in the sense that nobody in this room, we've never seen God face to face, right? Because God is, is, is spirit and, and we can't see God the Father, right? But when, when in, in God's word, in, in the Bible, and especially in Jesus, we see this revelation of, of who God is. We see the light of who God is, right? That, that God that we couldn't see on our, on our own, we couldn't perceive with our own eyes and with our own minds. We see his character and we see his nature through Jesus, right? Jesus lived the perfectly righteous life that we couldn't live. He showed us exactly what righteousness looked like. And if we remember from a couple of weeks ago, what's righteousness being the right kind of human? He showed, what, he showed us what the right kind of human looks like. He showed us what the right kind of human does. He showed us how the right kind of human relates to his creator. He shined the light on, on it so that we could see God. He forced us, and he forced us to shine that light deeper and deeper into our own lives and to see how we fall short and how we don't measure up. And then Jesus said that we are that light to the world. Because as we begin to internalize the truth that he gave to us, we begin to carry it wherever we go. And it shines on the lives of other people. They hopefully begin to see a little bit of Jesus' character and a little bit of Jesus' nature in us. They hear what he said through us. They hear about what he did through us. And they can't just keep living in the dark because of the second thing this passage tells us about light. The other thing this passage tells us about light, if you look in verse 5 and 6, this, this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live at... Light and darkness cannot coexist. Right? You either have a room that is light or it is dark. Right? If I were to come in here uh, this morning before the sun came up and before the lights were on and this room would be dark, I can't take some of that darkness, capture some of that darkness and kind of like make this area of the room dark. It doesn't work like that, right? Light just completely dispels the darkness and the absence of light. We have darkness. They can't coexist. And I think many of us, of us have tried too hard to have both. We want some light from God's word. We want to know the truth but we don't want to know it enough for it to hurt, right? There's no dimmer switch in the Bible. And when we try, we're not dimming the lights. We're changing it into something else entirely. Does that make sense? When we, when we take the message and we try to dim it and rob it of its, of its impact, right? We're not, we're not dimming. We're not basically taking the same message and making it kinder and gentler. We're changing it into a completely different message. The gospel is countercultural. It is upside down from the way that we look at the world. And just like a bright light in a dark cave, sometimes it's painful. I think the alternative is, is, is a lot more painful. The alternative is spiritual death. Because when we try to dim the light of the gospel, we don't dim it, we change it. It's not the gospel anymore. It's not the light anymore. It's something else. It's something that looks like a little bit like light. It seems a little bit like light on the outside, but it doesn't have the power. It doesn't have the life-giving power that the message has. And when the church refuses to shine the light, we lose our impact. And maybe we don't feel it. Maybe we don't see it on the outside. Maybe we still use words like Bible and God and Jesus. But if we compromise on the truth of the message, we lose our ability to impact this world. 
Church, we have no power apart from this message. And we have no message apart from the Word of God as given to us in the Bible. John Stott wrote about this about 40 years ago, and this is kind of prophetic if you think about it in terms of what's happened in the church over the last 40 years. <laughs> he said, if people today are looking for the right things, meaning, peace, love, reality, so, so many people, and I think that's still true today, many people today were looking for the right things. But they're looking for them in the wrong places. The first place to which they should be able to turn is the one place they normally ignore, namely the church, right? And we, most of us probably have a sense for this. People are looking for meaning and reality and the, and the, and the nature of truth. They're looking for it in all these different places. Why don't they come to the church? Why don't they come to the one place where we ought to look? And that's where a lot of Christians then start going off on tirades, you know. Well, that's just the way of the world today. Or man, these kids these days, these whippers, get off my lawn, you know. And... Um, but, but John Stott doesn't stop there. He turns it around back on us. He says, and there's a good reason for that. For too often, what they see in the church today is not counterculture, but conformists. A new, not a new society which embodies the ideals. That's why we're calling this series Kingdom Manifesto, right? Because this is Jesus' manifesto about what the world is supposed to be like, about the kingdom that he's bringing with him when he returns, and about the kingdom that he's already set up in the hearts and the minds and the lives and in the fellowship of those of us who believe. And it's a new society that he's, that's, that's the idea here of the Sermon on the Mount, is this, this new society. What does Jesus say about how the world should operate and about how life should be. And he says, for too often what they see is not a new society which embodies ideals, but another version of the old society, which they have renounced. They don't see life, they see death. He's right. We fit in too well with the prevailing culture around us. We are dropping more and more of the countercultural upside down message of the gospel in favor of the language of the establishment. Many of our churches have kind of a, a spiritual deep state, if you will. This idea that, that yeah, we, we've got a new, a, new, a new message and a new kingdom, but we're building it on the foundations of the old. Um, of the old. And when we do that, the gospel loses its power. It's not an announcement of the coming upside down kingdom anymore. It's just another voice jockeying for positions among the kingdoms of the earth. It's not the announcement of the coming kingdom of the sky. Do you know that's what, if you take the Greek and literally translate it, that's what Jesus says when he says kingdom of heaven. It's literally the kingdom of the sky. Right? And Jesus says we're, we're, we're supposed to be announcing the coming of the kingdom of the sky, but we're just fighting for position among the kingdoms of the earth. It's not what we're supposed to be doing. And when we do that, it loses its appeal and becomes just another voice in the crowd. And the church has a huge problem today with this in every possible area. We're all about living your best life now. We're all about the principles of prosperity and impacting political elections and court appointments and building bigger buildings and more church infrastructure. And look at what we're achieving. But Jesus came to drain the spiritual swamp that we have made ourselves at home in. And we're turning his movement to drain this swamp into a spiritual deep state. And it will destroy the American church if we don't stop it. You know, most of you know Tuesday is, is election day. And this is, this is going to be, you know, vote. We live, in a, we live in a culture in which participation, we live in, our, in, our, we live in this world. Jesus said we are in the world but not of it. We live in the world and in, and in this country that we live in, we have the right and the responsibility to vote. So I think that Christians ought to vote. Um, I know not everybody agrees with me on that, but I think that Christians ought to vote. And I think that, uh, um, that, that uh, I, I think that I have... Uh, I, have, I have a message from God here in the Bible, so that's why I don't, I don't push any political party or any politician or any kind of ideology from the pulpit because we've got bigger things to do. This is about Jesus. It's about his coming kingdom. And we don't live in a world in which one political party is, you know, Jesus talked about the narrow road that leads to life and the wide road that leads to destruction. This is not like one party is the narrow road and one party is the wide road. Both parties are the wide road. Both parties are, are, are the kingdoms of this world. 
And there are some people within those parties, that, that both of them, that are trying to, to bring in narrow road principles there. But, but both parties are the ways that Jesus is the narrow road. So, you know, what, what, your words from your pastor about how to vote? Pray before you vote. Vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. And pray for whoever ends up in power. Pray, vote, pray. Pray, ask God for wisdom. Vote according to that wisdom that you feel like God is giving you and pray for whoever our leaders are. That's, that's, that's what, we, what we do. And anything beyond that, I feel like I'm not, I'm not focusing in on this coming kingdom of heaven that Jesus is talking about. I'm worrying about these kingdoms in the earth that are all going to fall down one day anyways. So, number one, light, um, light exposes. It, it shows us what's real. Light cannot coexist with darkness. And the second thing Jesus talks about, if we back up, or actually the first thing he talked about, he says, you are the salt of the earth. And this one's a little bit more difficult. We, we understand where light is coming from. We got that, you know, but that's a metaphor that we use all the time in our culture. But you are the salt of the earth is a, is a little bit different. So what is salt? Why did Jesus choose to compare us to salt? What about salt are we supposed to emulate in our lives? One way to get a deeper understanding of what a Bible passage means is to look at what the great men and women who came before us wrote about it. We have to be careful about this because some of the people who have written about biblical texts in the past were idiots and some of them were heretics, uh, but some of them were brilliant. Uh, a few of them were all three, depending on which of their readings that you're... A guy named Origen is one that was all three. When he was wrong, he was epically, cataclysmically wrong. And he was wrong a lot. But when he was right, he was brilliant. And I think this passage is one that he got right. It's a guy named Origen. He lived in the early 200s, about 1800 years ago. And Origen focused on salt as a preservative. They didn't have refrigerators back in the ancient world, Right? Salt was used to preserve food. And Origen said that our life in Christ, the righteousness and the gospel message we've been given, work as a preservative to those around us. So number one, we are a preservative to a lost and dying world. Many of the old Jewish rabbis referred to the Torah, the law, you know, the first five books of the Bible, God's word, as the salt of the earth. And so that brings some meaning into it too. We realize Jesus isn't just, isn't just pulling a, making a metaphor up and pulling it out of thin air, right? He's actually uh, kind of entering into this conversation that the, the rabbis were having. They were saying the, 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 the law is the salt of the earth. And Jesus is like, no, no, close. My people living out God's principles in their lives, that's the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. We have the one and only message with the power to preserve people from death. We preserve life. And when we do that, the second thing is, salt brings flavor, right? It brings flavor into a fallen and tasteless world. And I think Christians need to hear this because a lot of Christians, unfortunately, I think we're doing the exact opposite, right? Right? Uh, I was talking about this with somebody before the service. Seems like a lot of the Christian music out there, I'm not trying to dog all Christian music, but a lot of the Christian music out there is kind of bland and flavorless, both musically and lyrically, right? There's just not a lot, there's just not a lot there to, to some of it, right? And I think we need to, to hear this because Christians are doing the exact opposite. We're just going through the motions, like it's some kind of funeral march. And when we do that, we do a disservice to Jesus and we do a disservice to the gospel because Jesus said, I came to bring you life. About 200 years after Origen, a guy named Hillary, yes, that was a guy, said, we are like sowers or planters, you know, farmers. We are like sowers who sow immortality and eternal life to all who would hear us. We're supposed to be bringing life wherever we go. We're supposed to be life-giving wherever we go. Another guy named Chromatius, he said, though the hearts of humanity, through us, the hearts of humanity have been seasoned with divine wisdom, though they have been made tasteless by the devil. 
Right? So we're, we're, we're seasoning the people around us with this godly wisdom, with this godly chokmah, right? This, this wisdom, this skill, the, you know, God's ideas and his purposes. Right? We bring life to the world. Everywhere we go, we bring divine flavor back into the world, or at least we should be doing that. The divine flavor that was lost when humanity fell into sin. One of the great philosophers of our age John Keating from the Dead Poets Society movie, Robin Williams, said this. How many of y'all seen Dead Poets Society? Right. This is, he's talking to the students here. You can probably, some of you are going to be able to picture him walking around the classroom saying this. He says, we don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race. And the human race is filled with passion, Medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, and I would add righteousness, purpose, godliness, joy, hope, all these things, these are the things that we stay alive for. The things that we do on a daily basis, the things that we have to do to pay the bills and to provide for our families, these are good, good things. They are necessary things. These things keep us alive, but they're not our reason for living. I think that's one of the reasons we have so many people that are depressed today, because too many people are living for the things that were only intended to keep us alive. Right? We we're saying, I can't wait to get to the end of the week. And then you ask why. Right? Well, because then this week will be over and, and it'll be next week. Oh, what are you going to do next week? I'm just going to try to get to the end of next week too. Right? We're living for these things. We're finding our purpose and our hope in these things that were only intended to keep us alive. And we're missing out on the greater things of life. We're missing out on the greater things that God has for us. Or to say it another way, we are serving the things that should be serving us. And John Keating in Ted Poet Society basically asks us to consider what do we stay alive for? Why is life worth preserving? And I think Jesus is asking us the same question. Right? We don't follow Jesus because it's cute or because it's fun or because it feels good all the time. We follow Jesus because that's what makes life worth living. Both in this life and especially in the next, it restores flavor to life. It restores purpose for life. And Jesus is saying, my people are the flavoring of this world. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we bring back the original taste to life that God created it with. We bring back that beautiful flavor of being in a relationship with our creator. We restore and preserve the goodness God originally created us in and originally created us for. We show the world what that goodness looks like in everything that we do. In everything that we do. This is not, like I said, this is where we're going back to the beginning here. This is not, okay, I got to tack on salt and light stuff onto what I'm already doing. This is, that's the thing about salt, right? You don't just tack on salt to the end of a meal. If you eat salt by itself, it's gross, right? Right? But you put it into the things that you're eating. You put salt into a, a dish that you've prepared, right? And it tastes good if you put the right amount of salt in, right? And if you put it into a dish, you can't, you can't have like a salty section and a not salty section. You got to keep them, keep them separated. And so, so many times in, in our Christian life, right? We're eating, we're eating the regular, we're eating the, the, the real life stuff, right? Our job, our family, all the, all the real life kind of stuff that we have to do. And we're like, okay, it's Sunday morning, time for the salt. Right? All right. No wonder nobody likes coming to church. Salt's gross by itself. But when we work it into everything that we're doing, right, that's when it becomes a beautiful thing. And that's where the Bible, a lot of people don't realize this, the Bible not only gives us permission to do that, it tells us that that's what we should be doing. Think about this, art, Right? If you like, to, if you like to, to create art, anybody in here an artist, right? Visual artist, musicians. We've got some musicians that, that played here Sunday morning or that played here a little while ago. We've got some other people I know out there that are musicians. God, if you like to create, your God is a creative God, 
right? We believe that our God is a creative God, that he created everything, and he didn't create it boring, right? A morning like this morning is obvious, right? The colors and the, and the different the, the textures and all the different things that we see in creation, Right? And even, and even now you think about like our, our bodies are made up of individual organs, right? Which are then made up of individual cells, which are made up of individual molecules, which are made up of individual atoms, right? If God wasn't creative, he would just like create one blob of like human, right? But we're intricately put together with all this, these different details and all these different things. Our God is a creative God. And so every time you create, you are displaying the flavor of God. Anybody in here like to build or fix things? Right? God is the master builder. Anybody like to, to work with wood? Right? Or, or cook meat. Anybody in here like to cook meat? Right? Oh, I love to cook meat and then eat it. Right? You are imitating your creator when you're doing that. You know, before God even created humanity, what did he do? He created all these different plants and all these different animals. Right? For, for to make the world beautiful, but also to give us food, right? And they don't taste, all well, taste the same, right? If, if God, if God, if God wanted, I mean, maybe he got a little tired when he started making animals because they all taste like chicken, but no, that's not, that's not true, right? Because, you know, we joke about that, but chicken and salmon and deer and pheasant and beef, they all have this different flavor. They all have this different texture to them. Even within the chicken, the, the dark meat doesn't taste like the light meat. And it doesn't just have a different flavor. It's got a different texture. God is creative, right? If you like to cook food, if you like to serve food for those around you, you're imitating your creator because what did God do, right? Before he created humanity, he set this giant table for us. For where we can just go and there's blueberries and strawberries and bananas and papayas and pigs and cows and all these different things that we could prepare and eat. If you're a stay-at-home mom caring for your children, you're imitating the compassion and the nurturing nature of God. If you're working in a, in a warehouse, I worked in a warehouse for a while. Anybody work in a warehouse? No? Okay. It's a little hard to find purpose at first in what do you do? Well, I take stuff from there and I put it over there, right? Think about this, though. If you work in an office or a warehouse and you file stuff all day long or you organize stuff all day long, and God is the master organizer. He took chaos and he created order and he created life out of it. You're imitating. When you take that, that giant stack of papers and you put them in the file folders so people can find them, right? you are imitating the, the, order, the order of your creator. If you like to play music, if you like to write stories, I like to write stories. Nobody wrote better stories than God. And God wrote the greatest, longest, most intricate, there's seven billion characters right now in it. And so when I'm writing, anybody ever, anybody ever thought before, like had something happen in your life where you had this thought, like I literally couldn't have written this better if I tried. Like that was so funny what happened or so ridiculous or so amazing or so painful or so tragic. I couldn't have written this better if I had tried. Anybody ever had that thought before? Like God is the master storyteller. And I feel like I'm imitating him when I write. One of the best examples of salt and light I've seen is by a guy who didn't even really know that he was doing it. It's a guy named Matt Harding. Uh, for six years, he got paid to travel around the world and dance very badly in uh, exotic places. And he says that he really does a, if you look it up, there's a TED Talk uh, with him on it. It's really cool. It's got a couple of bad words in it because he's not a believer, but it's really some really cool stuff that he says. Um, and he says that he didn't really understand the significance of what he was doing until after he had done it. But basically, he ended up bringing people together. He would just go, he would show up in a, uh, and some of you probably know who I'm talking about already. He would show up in this crazy place. He went all around the world, every continent. He went to Antarctica. He went to North Korea at one point. He would show up. He would set up a camera. He'd start doing this little dance like this. Anybody ever seen that before? 
And he started doing it by himself, and he got into this little village in Africa, and he sets up his camera and does his little dance, and all these kids start rushing out, and they start dancing around with him. And he realized, okay, for the first half of my trip, I've been doing this wrong. I need to be getting people to do this with And so everywhere he went, he would get people to come, and they would just dance together. And it was contagious. He would come, and he would just do his little dance, and everybody would join in. And you know how it is when you're, you're kind of going through life. We kind of go through life, and we're just kind of, you know, head down, going forward. But when you take a moment, and you, you take a break, right, and you just have fun, right? You, you dance. I'm, I'm terrible at dancing, so that's not fun for me. But if you like to dance, or, or just, you know, hanging out with people, talking, you know. There's a couple people in this room, we went to a murder mystery party uh, together a few weeks ago. That was, it was like just fun. It was really cool, you know. And, um, or just whatever that is, it, it kind of shocks you out of that, and you feel alive again, right? Shortly after I turned 40, uh, Phil asked me to fill in for the band one week, and I was kind of down because I'm 40 now, and that's bad, whatever, you know, and I filled in, and I played electric guitar, and I was like, man, I really needed that. I really needed to know, yeah, okay, I'm 40, but I can still play the electric guitar, you know, not very well, but I was never any good at it, so it's okay, and, and that's what's happening here in this video, right? He goes in, he does his little dance, and he's just bringing life and bringing flavor to all the people around him, so I want to show this video. We're going to show it in just, just a second, but I want you to think about this as like a metaphor for for my life, that everywhere I go, that everything I'm doing, I'm bringing flavor, I'm bringing joy, I'm bringing like the principles of God into, into the world. And, and if he can do it through doing this ridiculous little dance, like surely we can do it with the things that we do in our own lives.